it's incredibly exciting to be home. It's nice to be in the town I finished high school in, although that has some interesting drawbacks. Um, much of it hasn't changed since then, and that was a very long time ago. It's also nice to be back in my home country, and it's nice to be back in a place where we remember that that country had other occupants before us. It's quite remarkable to get to listen to a welcome to country. It's not something Americans know how to do, despite my many attempts to introduce it there. Um, I took a slight advantage. If you've read the program, you'll discover I'm not about to talk about what's in the program, but I did keep the title, so not too much anxiety for people right there. And what I wanted to do was kind of do a couple of things. One, that was an incredibly gracious introduction from Bev, who it turns out we've been talking to each other on the phone for nearly a decade and never met in person, so it's kind of a nice privilege for me too. Um, I am indeed uh, many things, a professor is now one of them, but I'm also an anthropologist by training and by upbringing. I'm the daughter of an anthropologist. I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. So I remember a very different sort of moment in Australian history as a result of that. Uh, for most of you, you'd know what that looked like in the 1970s in the Territory. I didn't go to school terribly often, I didn't wear shoes, I spoke Walpri and I killed things. I mean, it was frankly as good a childhood as a human being could hope for. <laughs> It was also an incredibly long way from Central Australia to Silicon Valley, and I went there in a roundabout way. I ran away from home to go to the United States. I did my undergraduate degree in the US, which was unusual at the time I did it. Um, I stayed on and did my PhD at Stanford. My background in those days was Native American studies and feminist and queer theory. Um, you can understand how a tech company clearly needed me. Um, and obviously desperately wanted me. Um, and truthfully, I ended up at Intel in a way only an Australian can. I met a man in a bar in Palo Alto <laughs> in 1998, and one thing led to another, and he gave me a job, and it was excellent. And I have spent the last 18 years in Silicon Valley trying to do the thing that I think is most important, which is put people into the business of making technology. It's one thing to talk about technology. It's one thing to talk about what it is that technology does, but if it's not doing it for things we care about, I often worry that might not be the best use of all of our collective energy, creativity, and intelligence. And so my job at Intel for 18 years has been to think about how do you use what it is that people care about, what they're passionate about, what frustrates them, and what they want for themselves, their kids, their communities, and even their countries. And how do you use those as a starting point for developing new technology? Not just solving a hard technical problem, but solving the right technical problems. And it turns out that requires a bit of work, and it requires being stubborn. It requires being very Australian in a lot of meetings. Um, and it also requires spending a great deal of time hanging out with human beings outside of the building. Because respectfully, I will tell you that while venture capital is one way of thinking about what's really going on, what people are actually doing is often a better proxy. Um, where the money is spent doesn't always tell you what the future will be. It frequently just tells you where the money's being spent. <laughs> and I want to be mindful of the fact that you actually can tell a lot about what the future will look like by what people are doing today. Because despite the logic of Silicon Valley and the stories we tell ourselves, what it is that we care about as human beings changes very slowly. Technology moves very quickly, but the tasks we're trying to get done, the things we hope to get done, and our pain points tend to endure far longer than most of us would expect. And so if you know what people are doing, you can often anticipate where the future is going. And in the context of talking about digital transformation, I thought that was a useful sort of starting point. I took the title of these remarks from a quote from William Gibson, one of my favorite um, sci-fi authors, but he was interviewed by The Economist back in 2003 about, well, frankly, digital transformation and the future of the internet and things digital. And he was being asked to make a series of predictions about the future, and to his credit, he said, listen, the future's already here, it's just that it's not very evenly distributed. By which he meant you could find the future in the present if you went looking for it. And so I went looking back on my hard drives, because I'm in the process of changing jobs, I suddenly have a lot of digital stuff around me. And I went back looking for a photo that I had from 2003, because I wanted to see what I knew in 2003 that might have been an interesting proxy. This photo was taken on a train platform in Tokyo about the same time this article came out in The Economist. What's interesting about this photo is that this could be a train platform today if it had different phones. <laughs> I mean, flip phones have made a comeback in Japan, but it took a while and they've only made it come back as a kind of nostalgia object. But if you imagine that people were no longer playing, well, in fact, at this point, they were doing location-based services in Tokyo, and they were playing games, and they were doing location-based online dating and playing a version of the Nokia Snake game we would all recognize. If you just substitute that out for apps, you're effectively looking at a view of the world we would recognize, and that's 14 years ago. So the reality is if you go looking, people are already doing some of the things we imagine are in the future. 
And what I wanted to spend the next 20 minutes doing was reflecting on some of those things. I've been lucky enough to spend my time in homes all over the world for the last 18 years, and I've seen bits of the future because I've seen bits of the present. And some of that future is entirely wrapped around all of the technologies you rattled off here about AI and cognitive compute and algorithms and big data and the internet of things and sensing technologies. Well, some of those exist only in labs. There are early instantiations of them and you can start to see how people feel about them and how they use them and what some of the challenges are we need to navigate as citizens, as consumers, as regulators and as builders because all of those things come into effect. And it certainly strikes me as I go through all of those, and there's about 10 I want to kind of highlight here, there are actually some really fierce problems that we need to solve that haven't been solved, that we keep kind of kicking down the road and going, well, that's just going to get taken care of. And it turns out it doesn't. And then there are some really stubborn opportunities that are not dissimilar, things that haven't been solved, problems that need to be addressed, places where we think the technology might do something, but we don't always. So what does all of that mean? Well, let me give you 10 really clear examples. The first one is really straightforward and has to do with, if the slide will advance here, maybe it will, maybe it won't, has to do with the notion of connectivity and networking and has to do with the fact that one of the ways we often talk about the future is by talking about Silicon Valley as though that were everything. And the reality is most people are not going to live in Silicon Valley. They're not going to experience what there is in Silicon Valley. They're living in places where, in fact, there are a myriad of different kinds of pragmatic and deeply practical challenges that have to do with things like they don't know what Uber is because they're using public transport. They're not interested in Airbnb because they're not going on vacation. They are not using a new set of services because that is not the mirror of their lives. And so one of the challenges we frequently have is that we take Silicon Valley as though it were an early adopter as opposed to suggesting it is actually an outlier. Not everything that happened in Silicon Valley became things we cared about. Um, I can list off a whole series of things, perhaps I should. Friendster, Napster, PDAs, The Newton. More recently, I can think of a whole series of others. I'm old enough to also remember things like Alta Vista, Yahoo. <laughs> Possibly a few other companies, we know them, right? And technologies too. And one of the things, had you sat in Silicon Valley and I was in on many of the meetings where those technologies were discussed, you might have thought they were going to be everything. In fact, we thought they were. Do you remember Second Life? Mm. That seemed to be pretty big for a long time and yet crickets. Now, what's interesting about every single one of them is they point to things. They are indexical of something that might yet come, but they aren't necessarily the object itself. Friendster made it clear that social networking technologies might be a big thing. Facebook worked out how to capitalize on it. You know, Uber may have been the first mover in cars, but frankly, if you look at some of the challenges they are now having with their ride sharing, profit pool activity as well as their leadership class, you might wonder that Lyft may be the name we remember years to come. So there's something here that says just because it's the thing everyone's talking about doesn't necessarily mean it is what will come to pass. And there is a reason to be skeptical about some of those things. And then just to collect the t-shirts that have the brands on them because you'll have an excellent library of them when you are done. <laughs> it's also the case that one of the things that I hear a great deal from consumers when I'm traveling with them is that life used to be simple. I have always loved this photo and the fact that this sign is still there. It's a sign I first encountered 12 years ago doing fieldwork in South Australia and I saw it again at Christmas and I thought I should photograph this sign again because somehow the notion that the internet is a destination is <laughs> perversely comforting. Um, it used to be the case when you talked to consumers that one of the things they said was it was relatively straightforward. I had the internet and the internet came with basically a service provider and they had my email and that was great and that's all I needed to know. When you talk to people now, they will tell you they have possibly one network for their phones, they have a different network for their home, their television may be delivered by a third, there may be a service provider who's giving the content, but also the network, there may be different service providers. They may have an email provisioner somewhere here as well as a personal email provisioner, there may be one at work. They may have multiple services that they are now either subscribed to, paying for, about whom people know, and usually the question is, I don't know when, who to call when it stops working. And some of those places are fairly hard to call. Mm. I brought my Amazon Alexa home with me. She does not like ADSL too, it turns out. Neither, as it turns out, do I. Um, <laughs> uh, but it turns out, you know, it's fairly hard to call the nice people at Amazon and go, hey, am I having a latency problem or is there something else intrinsic wrong with the fact that I'm now located with a Guam network to get my Echo to work, you know, in my house? Um, the problem here for consumers is they used to have one person to call and the call was relatively straightforward. I have no dial tone. 
the light switch is no longer working. We knew what it was to troubleshoot the network because the problem was simple and straightforward and the fracture line was visible. For most consumers, the challenge here now, and I would argue it is also true for citizens, and frankly, and sometimes it's true for us as companies, you don't know who it is that is provisioning the thing that is no longer working. And it's not simply a matter of tracking the wire back to whether it's plugged into the wall, because many of the networks are invisible, they are provisioned somewhere else. Is the problem you are having a network problem, a server problem, an algorithm problem? Where do you start to unpack that? And for lots of human beings, this actually provokes a great deal of anxiety because you don't know if things aren't working or if it's just you. And the number of times I've spent with people going, well, I don't know if it's just me. <laughs> then you go, no, that network's out. <laughs> or the reality that the networks are, much like the future, also unevenly distributed. Twitter may be working just fine here and be down in Turkey. And how you start to think about those things becomes intensely complicated. It's also the case that one of the things we frequently hear from people when we spend time with them is this interesting paradox which is that for engineers, one of the solutions to all of that fragmentation would be to have it seamlessly connected, it would be to put everything into one place so that you could find all of it. And certainly it was the case when we were first building out smart home proof concepts in my labs, one of the things the engineers would always say was, we can just connect everything. And you're like, excellent. And they go, so it'll be great. When you come home, the server will recognize the devices in the house, it will take all the new content and just back it up automatically. And then project it on the biggest screen in the house. And usually by the time you get to that third bit of the scenario, there was someone in the focus group or in the home looking at you and going, and doing what? You're going to project everything where? And usually that's the teenagers <laughs> who suddenly realize that the content of their phone is now being backed up on their family server and their parents may well know what's on their phones. <laughs> Irregardless of how well you think you know your children and in fact your partners and your parents, there are things you do not want to know about them. And you do not want it backed up on the network. Uh, for all sorts of reasons. But the reality here is that it's not just about the content we don't want other people to know, it's about all kinds of other things. In order for there to be 32 million phones in Australia and only 24 million citizens, that means some of us have more than one phone. There are reasons why we have more than one phone that have to do with access, that have to do with arrangements we have with companies, that have to do with the idea we want to limit access to ourselves. How many people in the room here only have one email address? Oh, bless. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. I need to talk to you afterwards too. Um, because it turns out most of us don't just have one email address. And in fact, most of us don't just have one active email address. We have multiple active email addresses. And while that may cause problems and you wish you could have a single view of them, there are reasons why we choose to segment pieces of our lives. And we always have. The challenge here when you suggest seamlessly connecting all technology is that human beings actually operate in a seamful world, not a seamless world. And so what it means to start to think about the notion that certain sets of data, certain sets of devices, certain algorithms may not want to touch other devices and data and algorithms is actually one of the ways humans have organized their lives. We also now see governments enacting not dissimilar kinds of challenges. Think about the EU's notion of the right to be forgotten and about what that means about the movement of data. Some data is not going anywhere. It is not seamlessly connecting to other data sets. It is sitting quite stubbornly in one particular place. So the distinction here between seamlessness as an engineering solution and seamfulness as a human practice is an interesting challenge to think about how we navigate. It's also the case that all of these new devices and services and apps have a security challenge called passwords. Now, it is certainly the case, according to the last study we commissioned and every study I have seen, that the most popular password in the English-speaking world is password. The second most popular password in the English-speaking world is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. These are not good passwords. These are, however, very popular passwords. Now, if you are like me, and indeed most Australians, you have somewhere between 17 to 20 active passwords, according to the most recent studies. That's a lot of them. Um, unless you have some algorithm by which you generate the passwords, Every service you subscribe to requires a different kind of nature of a hard password. Some can be letters, some have to be capitalized, some need an alphanumeric, some need a number. It's not a good look. And the way most human beings manage it is by doing something profoundly unsafe, writing it down. Mm. Um, or better yet, my favorite one still to this day, saving it on your hard drive in a folder marked passwords. <laughs> With the password being password, naturally. Um, so, 
as we spend time with people, I started asking people how they were solving the password problem. This was probably my favorite example. This was someone who was accessing the cameras in his smart home to see if his gardener was gardening the agapanthers, as you do. We were in America at the time. Um, and in order to find the password to the network, he had a book with all the passwords in it. But because all the things required new passwords, the passwords weren't all on this. Everyone gets crossed out. New things get written. This is in a book called Passwords in his um, briefcase. And I said, well, that's interesting. Do you have any problems with that system? And he said, yeah. And I said, what's the problem with that system? He said, well, it doesn't scale. And I thought, yes. And then I realised I probably should ask what he meant by not scaling because my vision of not scaling and his might have been different. And indeed they were. He said, well, it's with me at the moment and my kids can't get onto the Netflix account back in Australia. And so they're calling me to ask me what the password is and I have to find the book to tell them what the password is. And you're like, yeah, okay. Which immediately addresses a second problem here, right? Security people will tell you the biggest problem with security is human beings. We are the weakest link in the security chain. Turns out, however, there are, yeah, seven billion of us being the weakest link in the security chain. And much as my security friends would like, you can't engineer us out of the system. And as human beings, we are prone to be, well, not so good about security. I'm willing to bet in addition to writing down your passwords, you probably have a key to your house buried somewhere near your house, or someone else who isn't an occupant of your house has a key to your house. Much the same way someone who isn't you has passwords to your accounts. Now, it would be lovely if we all stopped doing that. The reality is there are many things that we share and that we share with people where the systems weren't designed for that to happen. And oh, by the way, try and imagine scaling this. So how do we scale a culture of passwords to smart objects, smart systems, smart devices? Will your thermostat require a password? Will your autonomous vehicle require a password? Will it need to be changed every three months? Will you be able to share that with your children? Multiple challenges here about how that all looks like. And oh, by the way, security is real. So solving the problem is actually a good one, but suggesting that we're going to do it through multi-factor authentication, which is the often one that says, right, well, we'll give you a password and then we'll check that it's you. Nicest way to do that is by proximity to your mobile phone. Um, if you've given your credit card to your partner, your administrative assistant, your child, they do not have your phone with them. So now the object doesn't work, but that actually breaks human relationships, not security ones. So as we think about this problem, the problem of passwords becomes a manifest and manifold one. It's also the case that one of the things I routinely hear in visits with people is this kind of question about why is the system recommending that to me? So we talk about big data and recommendation engines and algorithms. Consumers encounter it through preferences. They encounter it through things being served up to them, which inevitably creates interesting senses of both anxiety and questioning. Why is it that Netflix thinks I should watch that show? What is it that they know about me that they imagine that I should? Why is it that Amazon keeps recommending that thing that I am never going to buy? Or more to the point, why do they recommend the thing that's just like the thing I just bought that's already going to last two more years? Consumers have lots of questions about an absence of transparency in these things, but also a lot of anxiety about what it looks like. And when you push them on it just a little bit further, one of the things I have heard from people in some households is this really interesting ambivalence about the notion of their choices being conscribed by their past so that what you liked historically is all you get in the future. Many of us in this room, I'm willing to bet, have liked television shows and not wanted to see more shows like it and secretly hoped there would be different shows than the one that we have now watched a great deal of. Content is generated on the basis of prior activity because data sets are retrospective, not prospective. Algorithms are built and machines learn on the data that exists. And the thing about that data is it's what we already did, not what we're about to do. And so for some human beings, what we hear is an interesting anxiety, for want of a better word, about algorithms that make recommendations about the future because they worry that it will be like everything that the past has always been and they want to imagine that they're more interesting than that. The reality is some of us are not. But you know, I can see for some people that you might want to you know, exceed what you have done historically. We've also started to hear, and you should answer that, whoever that was. We're also starting to hear all manner of interesting questions, and I think this much relates to people's relationships to companies as it does to government, about how long will data last for? So how long are you gonna know that about me? It used to be the case, 
that you know one kept one's tax records for about seven years. Um, I can tell you, having come back to Australia after 30, the tax office is astonished that I have my tax returns from 1987. They seem more astonished that the tax returns in 1987 were purple than that I'm still keeping them, but you know, I can live with all of that. Um, it turns out, however, human beings are used to a certain amount of inefficiency in the system. Records degrade, people forget, things don't last. Psychologically speaking, that's a good thing. If you had to remember everything you ever did, everything you ever said, and everything that was said to you, you would go mad. And we like a little bit of forgetfulness in the system. It's how we manage. Systems of data are a little bit more complicated. Some of them don't scale simply because the company goes away, so the data set goes with it, or because the data is stored in a manner that means it's not forward compatible, so the data is left lurking on a digital system that is no longer, in some ways, accessible. But for a lot of humans that we have spent time with here, they worry about how long things will be kept for and what it means about them. They also worry in a world where companies have come and gone and they've built relationships with those companies and reputations with those companies, how those things scale. So I heard a little bit when I was in America three weeks ago as some of the um, troubles with Uber's leadership culture were un sort of un unveiled. Um, consumers moving from Uber to Lyft, but realizing that their reputation was tied to Uber, where they were seen as being good passengers, and it didn't immediately tie to Lyft, and they needed to become good passengers all over again. And there was an interesting notion about if your reputation is tied to a particular company, how does that move as the company moves? Not dissimilar in terms of people thinking about healthcare data and wellness data. If you're quantified self object, your Fitbit or whatever, collects data about you, but the company is sold to someone else, does that data travel with the sale? And is that what you imagined would happen when it did? We've also started to hear consumers' anxieties here about data sets that were collected under two different conditions being put together. So what does it mean when a large managed healthcare company in America buys all the credit card data of the people in its network? Well, it means you can now categorically prove that flat pack IKEA furniture does result in emergency room visits. Um, <laughs> which is a pretty innocuous finding, but you can imagine that going a lot further, right? So people starting to wonder about what does it mean to think this one through. And of course, the business model here is quite obvious. I was listening to uh, Frank Kelly on the radio this morning talking about how do you think about insurance risk? And for insurance companies in the United States and arguably in Europe, there's been a real interest in using IoT technology because it lets you move from modeling risk to measuring risk. But for human beings, there's some interesting things that get lost in the noise about all of that, right, or that don't get lost in the noise. So we know people worry about these things. We also know that when you get to this point of um, what people call privacy violations in the technical term, but every consumer I know just says, it was just creepy. And creepy is the word that gets used when the data gets too close. And this can run the gamut from, I mean, I'll cop to my own of coming to my ATM machine in the US this last trip and it wishing me a happy birthday. No, on the one hand, I mean, they had my mortgage, so I know they know when my birthday is. On the other hand, it felt like they were tipping their hand just a little bit much. Much creepier still with this same bank was when they wished me a happy anniversary. Um, and as I'm single, this was deeply troubling, but I realized, <laughs> I realized, in fact, they were wishing me a happy anniversary for my relationship with them. <laughs> and I had to take a step back and go, oh, that's not good. You've now told me much more about your tracking of me that I really needed to know in the guise of a personal experience what you've done has gotten really creepy. And humans in multiple kind of contexts here talk about this. We hear it in all manner of different circumstances where people talk about the system anticipating them too well of it being creepy. Um, I think the best thing I ever heard someone say to me was it was like having my mother rummaging around in my sock drawer. I thought, what an interesting image that is. Um, but there was this sense of it got too close, right? It was just too, per exactly that face right there. It was just too personal. And so as we think about how do you balance service delivery and the fact that particularly as governments, we know a tremendous amount about people without then also starting to feel like you have gotten so close that it is a form of surveillance. And managing through that one's actually quite tricky because humans like magic. So the notion that you're somehow going to say to me, hey, you like this thing, we know you're going to like this, and you're right, that's great. When you say, we know that you keep eating ice cream, so we've pre-ordered ice cream, that's less great for people, because it feels just a little bit like, a, in some ways, a surveillance and a, a judgment. Quite recently, this is again in the big data space and data visualizations, quite recently we did a study at Intel where we uh, implemented a series of smart water meters in consumers' homes and then came and talked to them about 
their water usage. It's in a place where water matters a lot like Australia. And in the first home we visited after the smart water meter had been installed, the two adults in the house, a husband and wife, got into a fight about the water data. And the fight went something like this. We use water all the time, every day, a lot of water. Yes. Why are we using all this water? Is the washing machine going every day? Yes. Why is the washing machine going every day? You like clean clothes every day. Has the washing machine always been going? We've been married 20 years. Where do you think the clean clothes come from? <laughs> and part of what suddenly became clear in this moment was that data and making data visible has the capacity to make a series of tacit rituals public and visible. And it turns out that's actually a little bit confronting. There are certain things we do that we've not ever had to talk about. And when the data is there making it visible, a whole series of questions get asked that weren't asked before. In another household, I was on a business trip. You came home at five o'clock in the afternoon and took a shower. Why were you taking a shower at five o'clock in the afternoon? I'm like, why is this a question? But you could see that there was a whole other notion about what else might have been going on where showering data became a proxy for a whole lot of other things. And there are more benign ones about, you know, questions about why do you flush the toilet so often? Really? Um, but part of what's going on here was that data, and we talk about data analytics and data visualization as though that is in some ways a very benign thing, it turns out to be revelatory of patterns we didn't know previously existed and surfaces in many instances relationships inter about power and relationships about social interactivity that are a little complicated. We see them on the um, agricultural side too. It's a very uh, substantial set of in Internet of Thing trials in upstate New York going on at the moment with dairy farmers. Um, RFID tagging cows with automatic milking machines. And so the cows trigger a milking machine and the cows can milk themselves. On the one hand, this is great. Uh, it turns out milk productivity went up quite dramatically. The cows go from being milked twice a day to milking themselves three to six times a day. It's great if you're a dairy farmer. It also created some interesting unease amongst the dairy farmers when they realised they had to confront the desires of their cows. Because up until then, they hadn't had to think about it. Cows just got milked twice a day, but when cows could milk themselves, they milked themselves considerably more often. I'm willing to bet if you've breastfed, you could understand that. Um, <laughs> but apparently, for a bunch of farmers, there was suddenly this moment of having to go, we need to think about what cows want. And that was uncomfortable. Um, scale that up and imagine what data might tell us about what things want that we haven't thought about. And the flip side of that is true too, right, as it sort of moves along one more, there is an interesting piece there about what that means in terms of, and maybe the slide will advance one more. Thank you, my good friend up there. Which is to say, as consumers start to realise that the system could be not just talking to them but talking to itself, the first thing we heard when we implemented smart home systems this way where humans were out of the loop. So that the fridge talked to the Amazon account, the lighting system talked to the utilities. The first thing when consumers show, were shown this concept was they said, wait, so, like, the whole system's gossiping about me behind my back. <laughs> and on the one hand, that's really funny. On the other hand, the word gossip is really interesting. Because it flags that this isn't about the way... This is not about privacy the way we have historically understood it. It's actually about reputation and about judgment. It's about what happens when you re-aggregate a whole series of pieces of information and give them meaning and context. And this is, you know, someone's spoof attempt of what it would be when your house renders judgment on you. Um, and what that might start to feel like. But we should imagine that this is already starting to happen for an autonomous car system to work. Cars are talking to other cars on the road. One of the things they're talking about is you. And how we start to feel about those assessments is also part of how people feel about and think about managing through all of this. And then, of course, it is hard to think about all of the new technologies and digital transformations without also being acutely aware that it happens against one more different backdrop. There's the backdrop of the networks and the built infrastructure in the physical world. There's the backdrop of our activities and our pain points and our usages. There's also the backdrop that all of this transformation happens against a landscape of the socio-technical, so of our imaginations. We've been told how this technology would work for decades before it arrived. We were told by Hollywood, if you were lucky, you were told by the BBC, because that at least suggested it wasn't going to work as well. Um, you know, for those of us who grew up in Australia, growing up with Doctor Who and Blake Seven were probably a real blessing. Um, they set us up for a digital world in a way that growing up with Star Trek really didn't. Um, we understand that not everything works the way it's supposed to and never comes with an owner's manual and is frequently used. Um, that's not always the case if you grew up with American science fiction where everything is shiny and new and works exactly as intended. Nonetheless, Every piece of technology in our world 
we've seen an image of somewhere before, we've read about it before, we've been told a scenario of it before. There is a very strong case to be made that one of the challenges that we have had in getting voice recognition technologies to be adopted with humans is that we grew up with natural language speech processing from Star Trek, where at no point did the system in Star Trek say, I don't understand your accent, Scotty. It just went, yes, we can do that, and semantically. By the same token, gesture is a much more limited set of science fiction references, and it's been a little easier for us to imagine what it should feel like because we weren't being told what it would be. So every piece of technology that comes along has a backstory, and that backstory isn't just a technical one. It's a one that's been both dystopically and utopically portrayed in the books we read, in the television we saw, in the movies we saw. It litters our conversations. You can't talk about robots in even a technical forum without someone asking you about Skynet, which, you know, will go live and kill us all. Um, inevitably, when you talk about robots, someone does say to you, in all seriousness, when is the robot apocalypse? Like June. but it'll be the, ro the, the vacuum cleaners, so we should all be fine. They're like Daleks, they can't climb stairs, it's all good. Um, but lurking underneath all of that is something you do actually have to attend to, which is that unsurprisingly, technology comes with a degree of anxiety and that's not irrational and it's not just about science fiction, it's also about our own histories. The deployment of multiple new technologies over the last 150 years have had remarkable unintended consequences, not all of which were delightful many of which reproduced existing social inequities and values that we may not want to think about as being part of our countries and yet we've reproduced them. Whether it's about algorithms that, uh, you know, I think of, can think of some camera processing algorithms that couldn't recognize black faces because they were only trained on white faces. Whether it's the first speech recognition algorithms that were trained only with male voices and literally could not hear women whether it was the SDK kit of a fairly large American tech company designed for health and wellness that did not include menstruation because, quote unquote, that's a niche usage. <laughs> um, it is the case, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, okay, okay, well, good, must, must be nice for you. Um, rest of us not niche over here. Um, there's a piece here that says one of the challenges as we build the future is our present and our past imaginations shape it unless we're willing to have critical conversations about those things, we bring it all to bear with it. So whether it's you should look around this room and go, yeah, if this is your peak body, we might still need some women and you know, maybe some other colors, that'd be good, and possibly some other kind of technologies. How we think about shaping all of this, if you're not asking the critical questions, we tend to reproduce our own lived experiences and those are in turn shaped this way. So where does all of that leave us? Well, in some ways it leaves us in this sort of final point here of saying, how do you put it all back together again? With better technology, there we go. How do you put it all back together again? And I think for me, the critical question here is a really straightforward one, which is that it's easy to talk about digital transformation and it's incredibly easy to be seduced by the remarkableness of the technology that is coming. And it is remarkable. I mean, you're absolutely right to say, what is coming now makes what has been look like a picnic. And as a researcher and as someone who's been in Silicon Valley for the last quarter of a century, what is coming is amazing. And some of that technology is really quite, I mean, it's provocative and remarkable and delightful and I can't believe I get to be part of all of that. But I also know if all we do is think about the technology, we set ourselves up not to be as successful as we could and should be. And then in fact, the hardest challenge we have when we talk about digital transformation, when we plan for it, when we want to take advantage of it, is how we remember that that transformation is only successful if we still get to be us when we're done. And that having humans in the middle, both as the objects and the subjects and the regulators of that technology is the most important and in some ways the hardest thing to do. Is not just talking about digital transformation, but digital transformation in a world where we are still human beings. Because even if the robots are here, we'll be here too. And there's a piece that says, how do we keep putting ourselves into that story and how do we keep thinking about addressing the critical pain points and aspirations for human beings, not just as consumers, but as citizens and as members of a series of cultures and countries and places. That for me is still the biggest unanswered challenge and it's the reason I came home to come solve it. So I'm very excited to get to be here to do that and to get to listen to the rest of you today. So thank you.